Hi, my name is Ami Song and I'm an influencer based in Los Angeles. My background is in interior architecture and I started my blog, Song of Style, in 2008. So it's quite ancient. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> 2008 was a long time ago. That was when people, uh, other people on the Forbes top creators list honestly had their baby teeth. Um, so you were one of the first people who ever really made influencing a full-time job. Tell us a little bit about the early days of influence and how you got your start. So I started my blog back in 2008 when I was studying interior architecture in college in San Francisco. And back then it was kind of like really embarrassing to like have a blog. I didn't have that like typical college party life. That's what I wanted, but I was working full time. So it, like having a blog was like a creative outlet for me. And I guess like I didn't tell anybody. And the first week, I want to say like I had five hits. I'm pretty sure those five hits was me just refreshing the page. And then eventually I kind of like got a following when I posted an out personal outfit post, like because I got a job and I was like really excited about getting the job as like a freshman in college. So I posted an outfit and I solely got the job because of my outfit because I wow. was wearing something that normal, like I guess a normal college student wasn't wearing. I was always into fashion since a very young age. So that that photo kind of went viral back in the day. So and it's crazy how things went viral because like, it literally was word of mouth. There was no like one place like a discovery place like Instagram or I don't know, like TikTok, where it's like easy to discover, like people literally manually had to type in your website or like somebody had to like tag you on their website and then you somehow find the website or blog. So it went viral, where, meaning like I got 500 hits. <laughs> and that was viral. <laughs> and to me, that was crazy because um, it was like such a new thing. And then, yeah, Instagram came along and it became just everything just got bigger and faster and quicker. And it became a career, like a full time job for me. Right. And we um, found uh, one of your earliest Instagram posts to okay. um, show people what oh my gosh that <laughs> that filter i don't even know i think it's like the valencia filter or something yeah that looks like that looks Overly like valencia maybe a little excess pro <laughs> with like little i don't know like dark with the little cu curved corners on the yeah. photo yeah that cringe. Was a thing. it's like very cringe it's very cringe so influence has obviously changed a lot i mean there's TikTok, there's youtube there's twitch how has the nature of influence changed since you began your career uh, like so much. I mean, for, for like how I started was a lot of like writing and just still images. And then Instagram came along, became like vertical images, YouTube, all like longer format videos. And then before TikTok, uh, I think there was Vine, which was like really 30 second, like 15 second videos. Everything became quick. Twitter, like it's just completely changed all throughout the years. And I feel like a lot of influencers and myself, I mean, I wouldn't say like everybody, but like some, like a lot of us had to adapt to like the changing mediums and platforms. Yeah. And you like truly are one of the first people to ever have social media make money off of it. Mm -hmm. um, I would say you are kind of one of the inventors of influencing. Talk about how the business of influence was shaped and the kind of deals that you bartered in the early days to the kinds of deals that you're making now. So in the very beginning, when I only had my blog before Instagram came along, it was mostly like banner ads, like thumbnail ads. That's how I made money. Like every month it would be like a, I don't know, like 150 by 150 pixel, like thumbnail ad. And I would charge like $200 or $300. And then in the beginning, I didn't really know you could make money. It was just like a side hustle. And I didn't really start making the full shift to like a full time influencer until like I was deep into Instagram, until I had management, until I was like making six figures. I didn't quit my day job, which was an interior designer. And I want to say um, I also have to give credit to like the people who who saw like the business aspect of it, which wasn't really me because I'm such a creative and I had my full time job as an interior designer. Like I didn't really think that I could. I didn't think highly such highly of like what an influencer was, because also back in the day, I want to say like 10 years ago, we were really looked down upon and we really wanted to be part of the fashion industry. And we were not really like welcome in the beginning, but I had 
like two great managers. So one, her name is Karen Robinovitz. She started DBA. And then eventually I have Vanessa Flaherty, who's my current manager. Like they saw an opportunity and they saw like this market that influencers also need like management representation. And then they did all the, you know, like business deals. So I want to say, I think it was because I had like a really great team, I was able to actually like dive into it and make a full-time career out of it. And now because of people like you, um, 86% of kids say that they're interested in a career in influencing according to a 2019 poll. What advice would you give to someone who is young and looking to have a career like you've had? Oh, wow. <laughs> um, I mean, also being an influencer is very multifaceted. Like it, it's not just like one thing where like you're just dancing in front of a video or you're just taking a photo. There's just so many different layers to it. And I think one of the biggest misconceptions is it seems so is easy. It seems so simple, but actually it's not. I know so many people who have like crazy content calendars who are really meticulously planning out their videos, um, scheduling everything out and like trying to like write down like scripts for like a one minute video that they're posting on Instagram or TikTok. So it's it's a it's actually more work than you think, but I think what we're showing is kind of a very curated and only the finished product, not like the process so much. So make, we make it seem so easy and fast. Uh, so I guess my if there's an advice that I can give them is um, I mean, if they want to do it, I think they should just experiment and go for it. But it is still a lot of work. It's not just like glitz and glamour that people think of. Yeah, think and, it is. and you're saying that it's a lot of work and there's so much that goes into it. But the aesthetic that's in right now is the TikTok aesthetic, which is very much, you know, phone over your face, lying in bed, saying random things. Um, it's not the millennial, super curated, mm -hmm. you know, like vacations and long dresses aesthetic that is what you uh, built your platform off of talk a little bit about that mm -hmm. what's the difference between this new like bedroom aesthetic uh -huh. versus the um the curated super made up high glam instagram I, feel like I think everybody just has like a depending on the platform there are things that work well and that don't work well like for an example like youtube is mostly like long format like if you're watching a 15 minute 20 minute video or a vlog of somebody you're like highly invested in this person but that necessarily is not gonna translate well on instagram so i and for tiktok i think it's also a very different audience and a different format so i think it depends depends on what medium you're using and i don't think there's like a right or wrong i think uh and i think for like so many different creators i think there's still like room for like a new creators to be on these different types of platforms and i think there's not i mean there is a difference because it's a different platform right um but i think that's just that's the beauty of it in a way yeah, do you think that Instagram, which is where you built your mm -hmm. brands, um, is here to stay? Do you think it, like, I feel like the I news think, seems to say otherwise. I think uh, a lot of people are frustrated because so many people have, I think it's like the algorithm, Instagram is trying different things, like trying so much to be like TikTok. I think the beauty of TikTok is also like the unedited, like nothing has to be so perfect and pretty and curated and i think a lot of people who are posting on instagram me like myself as well we're not posting super created images anymore like i have not filtered my image edited my image for more than five years wow. like i don't i don't think about like before like five years i mean i built I wrote a New York Times bestselling book about this, about curating and how to create your own brand on Instagram. But now that I look at it, it's so outdated. And this is this book was written like six, seven years ago about how to really create a personal like brand and like have that image where everything has to be perfect and look curated because this is the only time that somebody can like see your page. That was the idea. But now I think so many of us, a lot of us are so exhausted from that and me personally. So I don't edit. Um, and also back then, like 
even I want to say like maybe like four years ago, I was like literally planning, okay, if I'm posting this image tomorrow, I'm going to post this image so that they all like when somebody comes to my feed, it makes sense. Now I don't care. Like I don't even have that extra app to plan my feed, so to say. And um, I think it's not because of TikTok. I think it's because people just kind of got fed up with like the super polished. Everything is like a highlight reel when all of us are literally suffering inside. Even celebrities are, even if you're like a multimillionaire, everybody's secretly like, I don't know, like they're all depressed. It's, a, it's such a love hate relationship, <laughs> yeah. Chef, right? So um, yeah, like I, so I think just being more raw on Instagram helped, but I think TikTok is like a whole nother level because it's like also the younger generation and also the I think what's the beauty about TikTok is literally you don't have to be an influencer you don't have to have a platform you could literally anybody can go viral and I think that's the beauty of it and it feels just so much more raw and real and your TikTok is amazing because um, on the Forbes top creators list, you're actually the person with the highest engagement rate on TikTok. I am. Um, <laughs> yeah, which is like, so it's 47.8% uh -huh. is what you have. Okay. Um, and that shows an amazing amount of brand loyalty. I mean, that is a crazy number. How have you been able to foster that amount of love between you and your fans after all these years? I think because it's been so long. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like because I've been around for so long uh, that the audience that has stayed with me like throughout the years they feel like they really grew up with me and they know me you know and it's weird because sometimes i can't when i'm like talking to like a friend or like somebody like an acquaintance and i'm just talking it's hard for me to like articulate whereas if i'm just talking through the camera without anybody i i'm so much more vulnerable and open if that makes any sense well uh that does make sense it's not something that i often hear though um, I mean, you're 35 now on TikTok. What's that like? I don't know. I've seen so many other people that are older. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and another thing about you um, that's pretty unique is you have a very strong brand of your own, Song of Style, mm -hmm. um, which makes these beautiful dresses that you're wearing and the $160 off-the-shoulder sweaters, satiny rompers. You sell exclusively on Revolve. and. Um, I'm hearing that that made $12 million last year. How have you balanced your personal brand with your clothing brand um, and making money? Uh, well, with the clothing brand is completely different. So I really act as like the creative director and like the visionary, but I also have a great team. I would not be able to like run the clothing brand by myself. I have like literally an amazing team of women who are so dedicated and are able to execute my vision. So I have that. And then I have my in influencer job. So I also have, with my influencer job, it's not just me. I have an incredible management team that help and support me. So I'm able to kind of like, I guess, have two different hats. And now I'm a mom, so I also have that. <laughs> but as a mom, I'm not gonna lie, I just hired a full-time nanny and it's been life-changing. And Congratulations. I, like, I could huge. breathe. Like, I was miserable the first two months because I didn't have any help. But now that I help, I feel like, oh my gosh, life is so amazing. <laughs> yeah. How did having a baby impact the relationship you have with your fans? Um, well, I've always been quite, I not from the very beginning, but I'm, I'm pretty like very vulnerable. Like since, I don't know, like since I kind of had like a mental breakdown like years ago in Paris. And I'm very honest and I've noticed like my audience loves it when I'm like super honest and real about things like whether it's my mental health or how things are going like instead of like showing all like only the pretty parts of life. You yeah. Know? So like with the baby, honestly, I did not know how hard it is to like raise a newborn like every influencer that I follow even friends that I have. I don't mean I don't have a lot of friends who have babies, but even some of the friends that I have, nobody told me that like they all say, yeah, you don't sleep like, oh, make sure you sleep before you have the baby because you're not going to get any sleep. But that's all they said. Like, <laughs> I didn't really realize you don't get any sleep or yeah. like how much work 
goes into it and everybody's posting like smiling happy baby photos or like oh my baby is so precious and i was like he's crying like i don't know what's happening like is this normal and apparently it's super normal but people just don't show the crying part and i thought there was something wrong with like the way i was like raising the baby or something like of course the baby's gonna cry because they can't talk that's the only way for them to communicate yeah and and then when i finally got a nanny like a baby nurse in the beginning I was like, does my baby cry a lot? I feel like he cries a lot. And she's like, no, your baby is like so like mellow compared to most babies. Most babies cry like 40 minutes nonstop. And I was like, but my baby's been crying like five minutes nonstop. He's like, yeah, that's like nothing. And I had no idea because nobody shows that on social yeah. media. And like babies not sleeping, like my baby was not sleeping. So I didn't know that either. Like babies don't sleep but they need to sleep like they need to sleep like 20 hours a day. Mm. I didn't know that. Mm. Yeah. And you've been, <laughs> you've been pretty open sharing your baby um, pics on Instagram. Yeah, I did a home birth. So all of that kind of stuff. I'm very like honest. I, I feel like somebody has to be honest about like the baby. And also the other thing is like my community has been so helpful. So you're saying like, how does my like audience and my followers like feel about me having a baby? I feel like I got closer to like the mom audience that I had. So like at 35, I guess I'm more on like the later stage of giving birth, like having a child and a lot of like my peers, people that are my age, already had their babies or they're like probably like two years three years ahead of me so I've been like I feel like I've gotten so much closer to my community who, especially the ones who are moms because I didn't realize how supportive moms can be like they're literally the most supportive group of women ever because they've been through it and I feel it too when I'm walking down the street and I see like a woman carrying a newborn I'm like I got you like, do you need help? I know you. <laughs> I know how you feel. Like, I have empathy, like so much empathy towards these women. Right. And you're you're also like the the pregnancy content has done really well on TikTok. Mm -hmm. um, your pregnancy re reveal, which you posted, got 9.4 million views on TikTok. Can you talk a little bit about this moment um, revealing your pregnancy to your sister? Yeah, I, honestly, I think my sister takes the credit. Sister. Like, it's not me. Cause my sister's just so cool. Like, so like unfiltered. She literally like threw the shirt that I made for her, like at me at a pregnant <laughs> lady. Cause she's so shocked. Uh, yeah, and I, I, I think that's the beauty about TikTok. <laughs> like, you don't know what video is gonna go viral. Right. Well, this one clearly did. So, yeah. so you did something right here. Um, and I, I also, you know, you're. This is Forbes, and we are estimating that you made two point three million dollars last year. That's, a, that's lot a lot of money. Yeah. Congratulations. I don't girl. know where you guys are pulling these numbers, <laughs> but wow, insane. Yeah. So can you break down a little bit about your business and show us behind the scenes? What are your earnings like? Where are you deriving your money from? I mean, my earnings, you can talk to my management <laughs> about them. They know all the financial aspect of it. But um, like in terms of like jobs, how it works is usually I don't really do a lot of one off jobs. Like the most like for me, I want to build a long term relationship with whatever brand that is that I get to work with. And I'm also very selective of the brands that I get to work with. So whether it's like a beauty brand, I have extremely sensitive skin. So they'll send me samples. I always try it out. There are so many times where it doesn't work with my skin type, so I can't work with them. And then um, there are brands that I'm absolutely obsessed with. And then usually we're able to create like a long term, like a year, um, like a year, like worth of jobs so or yearly contract then I do like X amount of like posts for them like that kind of stuff like create content edit and then post on my social media mm -hmm. some of the brands that you work with include Burberry Valentino but also like Amazon fashion mm -hmm. obviously you're spanning the gamut of super high end to Amazon mm -hmm. why so actually Amazon was very fun to work with so how I first work with them was doing like these live videos. Yes. And they're like, do you think you can do this? And I'm like, oh my gosh, I love talking. Yes. And I would always get in trouble because my segment would kind of run longer because I wanted to talk more than a year, like an hour long. Um, and then the thing about Amazon is I shop at Amazon. Like if you ask my boyfriend, he'd be like, he literally goes into my cart and removes the stuff because <laughs> <laughs> we would get like I think we get like four packages a week like it's insane like I mean if it's working like, I don't know I I just shop at Amazon like literally 
it's just so easy and it just made sense because it's something that I use every single day. Like, why wouldn't I want to also shop on like promote Amazon if it's if it's something that I do? And then with the luxury clients, like I how I think about my audience is obviously my audience is very diverse. It's not just that one type of girl, but majority of my audience is they're very like educated. Um, the, they want to splurge on like luxury items with like handbags. They might not necessarily buy the whole outfit, but they'll splurge on like handbags or shoes. But then again, clothes wise, they want to find something that's more affordable, um, accessible, but they do care about like where things are made. So they do care about like the materials. They necessarily don't want to go to like H&M and Zara. They just want something slightly different and sophisticated. And then also like they're very interested in like home. So like for Amazon, like my all my home stuff has done extremely well. Yeah. And w I'm really curious to know more about this live streaming thing that you did with Amazon mm -hmm. because, you know, this like QVC style live shopping is very popular in China mm -hmm. um, and it hasn't really like made waves over here. Um, do you see this type of commerce and marketing taking off for American audiences? Uh, I think a lot of brands are actually trying that that part like even Instagram kind of has like that live thing going on uh, and the, I feel like I don't know if it's going to take off I feel like there's so many uh, like players that are trying to see what's going to take off so I don't know I honestly don't know I mm -hmm. think it, it's a surprise yeah well we'll see um, going back to the relationship you have with your fans by your engagement rate on TikTok by your earnings Clearly, you're, it's working. Um, how have you cultivated that relationship? Like, have you been like responding to a million DMs? Talk a little bit mm -hmm. about how you built that loyalty. Well, DMs is hard because I do get insane amount of DMs, and I'm now that I have a kid, I'm like I just can't be on my phone all the time. But uh, in terms of how I cultivated the relationship, I think from the blog like i mean obviously like listening to my audience like li like reading their comments i try to respond back if i can uh i think that's how i've just done it yeah to be honest i don't know if there's like a like a special magic or anything but i do ask my audience a lot hey what kind of content do you guys want to see more of i do a lot of like q a's um, i answer their questions and i think in some way that makes me and that makes them like makes us closer yeah well fashion and social media have had a very complicated relationship um, but it's also a very deep uh, relationship and you know one specifically weird thing that i'm thinking of right now is sheen halls people want things that are sustainable and mm -hmm. economic yeah. um and that are good for the world but then there's also people on TikTok who are like i just bought a hundred yeah. million things and killed a forest to have all this party dresses. Um, it's just very complicated. Can you kind of untangle it for us? I mean, I think, you know how this, I think there, it's just hard, like with Gen Z especially, there is a group of Gen Z uh, audience that are so aware about like the planet the, the, and we're like, oh my gosh, like, thank God for Gen Z. They're going to be like literally the ones saving us from like, <laughs> this like situation of like oversupply waste pollution yet you also have another part of like gen z and not just gen z other audience where literally they're doing like the sheen hauls and shopping from very very unethical stores and brands literally where things are going to fall apart so i think it's hard to just with anything it's hard to box a generation or like people like generalize oh, just because this fashion girl is like one thing, maybe another fashion girl is completely different. It's hard to generalize in general, right? I still, even with TikTok and Instagram, it's you can kind of have an idea, but it's still hard to generalize. Oh, Instagram people are all like this and TikTok people are like this. So it's a, I don't know, it's a very tricky tricky situation in my right. opinion yeah and it's literally everyone i mean everyone's on these social media platforms everyone puts clothing on their body every day or at mm -hmm. least i think everyone does because be i also end. think i also discovered a whole nother group of people who only thrift and they thrift in such an incredible way um and so yeah, that's, that's like so hard. yeah that's like also disservicing like these thrifters because they're really actually the ones are being more mindful and not over consuming right to kind of group them in with the other girls that are or influencers or TikTokers who are doing the sheen hauls. Yeah. So on consumption, I mean, we are heading into what's looking like some pretty dark times economically. 
How do you think that a maybe looming recession is going to affect your career mm -hmm. and that of influence, specifically fashion influence in general? I started my career in 2008 during the recession. Okay. So uh, I'm very mindful of what I sell and preach and show to my audience. Even on my Amazon lives, I said it multiple times that I'm here. Like I would always feature some of the same things because I myself am a consumer, but I also don't want to like shove products to people. I want everybody to be mindful. If you're going to buy something, if you're going to invest in something, I want them to invest wisely. Make sure it's not something that you're going to wear just once. And that's how I consume products as well. Like when I'm shopping for myself, eat no matter how what the price point, I need to be able to wear it like 10 million times. Like the shoes that I'm wearing, I've worn this. This is like from my, my our very first launch when I did my song of style shoes uh, from, I think, three years ago, I'm still wearing it. We still have new shoes, but I, this is like one of my favorites that I go to. So I am very mindful of it. And I think the audience knows. And I think I think they just know that I'm not always there shoving products. Your audience knows you really well. They've known you since 2008. What is the future of Ami Song? <laughs> the future of Ami Song? Uh, I wish I knew, but I think that's the beauty of it. I will actually, one of the things that I really want to do is make Song of Style into a really lifestyle brand. So I did the clothing. We're coming out with denim, which I'm super excited about. And I actually spend a lot of time on Song of Style because I just feel like it could be a legacy. So I'm trying to like dip my toes into like, how can I make Song of Style into like a whole completely lifestyle brand that like really embodies who I am, the Song of Style woman. So that's my focus. And then the other thing that I would really love to do is I wrote two books, but I would like to actually do like a memoir of like my upbringing, my whole story. Um, I think there aren't that many Asian voices in like my industry and just like for in America, it's hard. Like even for me, I it was hard for me to like find other like incredible Asian women that I could look up to. So I would I would love to be that for the younger generation.